Hi, I'm Symphoniers, and today we're taking a look at this game I made in Godot. Um, it is a kind of visual novel game that I did to learn Godot. It's my first game programmed in it. Uh, the intent was to learn how to do a Disco Elysium kind of style dialogue system, and I didn't quite match the style beat for beat everywhere, but I got something working well enough, I think. And I wanted to share, uh, share it in case doing so was helpful. Do kind of a post-mortem on the project, talk about uh, how I did it, what I think failed or uh, turned out well, and etc. Um, and yeah, it's not going to be a strict tutorial because there's too much stuff to cover for that time. Um, or for the time I want to spend on this video, but the intent is that between, you know, walking through it and posting links to a bunch of resources I used in the description, that if you're interested in making a game that can have branching choices and dice rolls and things, uh, oh no, we lost the roll, ah, uh, that, that you can, um, do it, do a thing on your own. Note this, uh, motion here for later, um, yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about this. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm not, it's on my itch.io page if you want to go check it out, link in the description again. And yeah, I guess just top to bottom, or no, sorry, the, the first thing we should talk about maybe is the dialogue manager, because that's a big important thing. Um, that is weird and uh, d difficult about Godot if... If you're brand new to it like me and you don't have a lot of programming experience like me and etc, you'll almost certainly want to use a dialogue manager, a dialogue plugin available through the asset library on Godot. Um, and there are a bunch of them, and they are kind of all annoying in their own way. <laughs> Uh, a big problem I had, I checked out a bunch of them and tried to make a bunch of them work for my project. A big problem I had with a lot of them was just not being able to actually figure out, like, how do we pull the dialogue out of the kind of back-end system and get it into the front-end that I want to build? Because, like, Dialogue Manager, the plugin, it's really good if you want to do JRPG-style stuff. Um, uh, like have have the big text box at the bottom of the screen and so on, or kind of work within that style vaguely. Um, I could not figure out how to pull out, uh, like the actual lines and things, uh, for my own use or for use with my front end. I'm not saying it's impossible, just I, I didn't figure it out. Shrug. The only one I could figure it out for was Clyde, which is a uh, simpler, one of the simpler dialogue managers in that you just write a script in here and then through the code in, like, the main code you can expose all of these dialogue lines and stuff. Um, and it's uh, tricky. Uh, so as I kind of gestured at, I've been I was frustrated with a lot of the dialogue options available to me. Um, a lot of the tutorials and things for them are of varying quality, like Clyde's tutorials are very fast, which is not great as someone without a lot of programming experience and stuff, and that led to some frustration points. Clyde also has uh, some odd stuff going on, or it has a GitHub for the language, the Clyde language, the kind of syntax that it uses, and then it has a GitHub for the actual Godot plugin. And not realizing the distinction between the two made pulling up resources for them, uh, for things kind of confusing. And yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, in the end, I I was able to get Clyde working kind of as well as you would want for a basic implementation. I'm being particular with my wording there because uh, I, I feel like I'm kind of operating at the ceiling of what Clyde can do. Like, this is not Clyde's intended use case, as far as I can tell. Um, if you look up, like, what the dev kind of designed it for or whatever, it's for much shorter like single character interactions and stuff and i'm not using like literally every trick in the language or whatever uh in, in clyde the language or clyde the plugin here like i i can maybe get a little bit more mileage out of it the the kind of general problem i i or the kind of ceiling i'm hitting with clyde is like uh you will notice that if let's zoom in here 
Uh, you'll notice I have to break out a huge number of lines. I think I defaulted in the end to just breaking out every single line, by which I mean putting that slash there so that the quotes in the line were not read as special characters and didn't interact with things. Uh, I think I still can't or still don't know how to use a colon in writing without Clyde freaking out, which is not ideal. Um, the triggers are a little bit difficult to manage, or I, I ended up defaulting to sort of slightly odd arrangements of uh, like check if the stat, check the stat there. Uh, I, I ended up sort of breaking apart various triggers and things like uh, the ways you manipulate things in Clyde to separate lines and so on just to try to make them work better. Um, with branching choices and stuff too, I ended up having to send things to separate text blocks just because Clyde wouldn't let me format stuff within the choice the way I wanted. Here's an example, sorry, yeah. Uh, if like this dialogue loops, part of it loops back into the main thing, part of it goes elsewhere, and uh, that's partly because like I, uh, I just could not get uh, full, full dialogue to work uh, in there with roles. Here we go. Yeah, doing, uh, so this is Clyde firing on all cylinders kind of for me of like, uh, at the start of the line, we evaluate charisma to determine whether or not we show the line to the player. Then we set a DC variable that we use in the script front end that I built um, to determine whether we display a positive result or negative result line. Uh, and then we trigger roll charisma. After that, we check the roll charisma variable. Below that, we go elsewhere because you cannot write text in here. It, it's annoying, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if, yeah, if you roll above it, you go elsewhere. And like, th this entire thing here works. It is not a joy to write. I am, I do not feel confident that I can just like bust this out without thinking about it uh, in the future. Um, and that type of friction and stuff is not great in writing uh, like that and some of the syntax things I was talking about and with the rest of it and so on. Uh, there's also some other sort of, I don't know if annoyances are the right word, but like, um, it would be nice to be able to write in italics in Clyde, or to use bold, or the front end I've built can display HTML, hypertext, etc, etc, like it can do wiggly rainbow text or whatever. And I think I can technically do that uh, within Clyde, like manually writing the HTML code or whatever. But that sucks. Like, I don't, I don't wanna. <laughs> uh, so I have to make decisions of like, well, do I want to uh, learn how to do that? Do I want to adapt to the front end, etc., etc. Et and yeah. So Clyde, it it's good. It does. Uh, I'm already going too long or spending too much time on stuff. It's good. It's useful. It's the only thing that worked f the way I wanted. Um, I declare a bunch of variables at the start. Uh, yeah. Good, useful, does everything I wanted, but it, it's like it, crispy, it's a little deep fried, it's a little bit like not quite the thing I want to be really be firing on all cylinders and writing smoothly and so on. As closing Clyde thoughts, I declare a bunch of variables. I don't even think I'm declaring these properly. I say a bunch of variables at the start. I don't think I need the at symbol specifically, but I'm not 100% and don't uh, sure on that and don't want to break things. Uh, I put them there just to help keep track of them for me in my brain. Uh, the other thing I do in here that's like a format or style thing that I maybe wanted to note is I will have a pointer to a dialogue block um, here, and then I will have the di uh, dialogue block before that, uh, because Clyde will process lines sequentially by default, and if you slip or like miswrite a line somewhere and the player slips out of dialogue, uh, if... <coughs> If you lead blocks with this, it will help feed them into other dialogue, so the game will still break. Like, you're not going to save yourself miswriting Clyde's dialogue by doing this, but it helps it break less bad if you if you make a mistake somewhere. So that's like a style thing I did or would maybe sort of recommend. I don't know, uh, it's maybe worth flagging for the stuff in general. 
hey, I, I w was making this up as I went along and so on. Like, none of this is best practices. I'm not an experienced programmer or whatever. Um, I just am trying to work through things to, to help folks, you know. Uh, I, I had so many moments in kind of learning or doing this project or whatever that were like, oh, this didn't need to be this hard. This didn't need to be four hours of interpreting uh, six different results and yada, yada, yada. Uh, so yeah, that that's very much part of the inspiration with making this video is just help other people dodge those four hours. Bunch of variables at the start. I don't think I necessarily want to talk about any of them offhand. Uh, main thing I would maybe flag is just on ready is in front of pretty much all of them. That helps avoid uh, just issues. I think it's only necessary for about half of them, but it just helps avoid issues where other things look for that variable and it's null, like it has nothing loaded in or whatever. Um, so I just ended up defaulting to that as a kind of style thing. Uh, in our ready function, we have scroll bar connect, which we can technically declare up here, but I'm doing it in here for whatever reason. Uh, this scroll bar connect thing is handling some of the animation in the text box that you see. Um, yeah, we are tracking whenever the scroll bar is changed. And we, we uh, whenever it changes, we execute a function that animates down to the bottom of the text box thing. Uh, it's maybe worth just briefly pulling this up again. So yeah, we can have some dialogue and stuff. We can go, we can scroll up, click, and it will go way down to the bottom and stuff. And that's a feature I put in because, I don't know, it seemed seemed nice. It helps animate things anyway, like make things smooth. I'm cheating it a little bit. Um, we'll get to it in a minute, but I'm spawning in a bunch of empty kind of blank space at the top and that helps it animate smoothly from the beginning instead of needing to fill up first in order to get this kind of nice like scroll up effect. There might be a better way to do it. I uh, Again, I don't know. <laughs> So aside from the scroll bar thing, yeah, sorry, this is actually the exact thing here. Uh, I just run a for loop with a thing that calls the message space spacing function I wrote, or that uh, spams a bunch of blank lines. Um, For dialogue stuff, we're also doing Clyde dialogue setup here too. We are booting up a Clyde dialogue, uh, f declaring uh, the dialogue variable as a Clyde dialogue. Then we're saying, hey, load the Clyde dialogue file, um, and then start that dialogue, and also connect some other functions in the code to that dialogue. Uh, this is kind of a default thing that Clyde will suggest as, in terms of a uh, basic style thing. Oh, um, I on the off chance the person programming Clyde sees this, there's, there's a file within Clyde that is incredibly useful. <laughs> Um, Clyde, is it example? I think it's example. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of branched a handful of the code out of this into my project, or like pulled a handful of the code in this into my project. Uh, this was so useful for getting Clyde actually running in my project, and so much uh, cleaner and more straightforward than try, uh, trying to go cobble together an implementation from uh, like the other videos and things. And it's like, have a tutorial on how to use this file. It, it's so good and clean and like designed for learning and stuff. Why why are the Clyde tutorial videos not use, using this thing? And I don't want to be too cranky or whatever about it because anyone, uh, you know, contributing resources to a community for free or whatever, thumbs up, like, uh, you, you have a place in Valhalla or whatever, like, uh, but yeah, that that was a a kind of like fr friction point or just a thing that bugged me a little bit. Anyway, we've worked through the ready function. Woo! Uh, I'm not using uh, input is a kind of default Godot function you can use, and this one is checking for the escape button, and it's saying, hey, if the if the player hits the escape button, shut that shit down. Close close the program. And yeah, that that's it. I just th that was one of the simpler like kind of back end game functionality things to implement. So I did it. 
Uh, here is the scroll bar animator thing. I'm using a tween to animate it. I was using tweens for more things in this project. Uh, Godot in the documentation or whatever and it says like, hey, if you're using an animation, if you want to create an animation on the fly, use tween. If you have a repeatable animation, use animation player. And I ended up it, through this project learning like kind of why that's the case, but uh, yeah, so the handle scroll bar changed stuff. We're generating a tween um, kind of thing, animator, whatever. And then we're saying, hey, whenever this function is called, drag that scroll bar down to the bottom. Uh, so whether it is, you know, just up a little bit, just up a lot, it will automatically scroll to the bottom over the course of one second. Uh, as opposed to, like, if you were to try to handle this in animation player or something, you'd have to do, like, weird for loops, and, um, it would just be awful. And, yeah, uh, we'll see more animations later that will help kind of compare and contrast. So, on Start Dialog Pressed is a thing that I just have to, um, make spawning the dialogue and stuff a little bit cleaner, or, like, to have the... so I can have the title page and stuff, and then the main system kicks online. Uh, so this is doing another tween thing. This could probably be an animation player thing, whatever. Um, we make another tween, but instead of animating a position property, we are looking at a panel and modulating A, modulating the alpha channel on that panel, uh, to 0 0.8 over one second. Um, this panel, I should have named it better, this panel is the kind of black background panel on the dialogue side, so you can see that fading in. Uh, not really, since we're black on black, but... Uh, yeah. Black thing on the side, we animate that in using the tween. You can see it more now. Um, we say get next dialogue line, so start populating the dialogue box, and then eventually the rest of the code will take over. Uh, and then start dialogue.qfree, uh, get rid of this button. Kill this button, remove it from stuff, etc. Uh, so that's handy. Get next dialogue line is where the code starts to come online or starts to really do things. Um, inside of this, we are declaring two variables: dialogue or content, uh, which is dialogue.getContent. We're pulling the line contents out of Clyde, and then we have a speaker variable, which is content.getSpeaker. If content.speaker uh, is not, whoop, pardon me is not null, else uh, put in a blank for the person speaking. And then we evaluate the content that we're pulling to see a couple of things. Um, if the content type is end, if it's the end of the dialogue, uh, I think I ended up removing some of this functionality, or it doesn't actually come up in the game because I made the game kind of loop back on itself, um, but it will clear all the contents out of the tree uh, out of the dialog box, rather, and then uh, kind of clear that stuff out. So that's a thing. Uh, if the content type is line, do some stuff. If it's the player speaking, execute prime buttons. We'll get to that. Uh, and mark NPC flip-flop as false. NPC flip-flop is a variable that I'm using to determine whether it is the player or a NPC, or like a non-player character speaking. Um, and depending on that, we animate either, uh, we either automatically progress through the lines and do that kind of sh 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 thing, or we don't, and we ha we're, we wait for the player for input, uh, to press a button. The, the prime of the buttons function puts the dialogue into the buttons, uh, and then the player can press it, and then the buttons will go into the text box and etc. Um, I, that's not what Disco Elysium does. What Disco Elysium does is whenever, uh, you need to progress through dialogue, even if the player is not talking, it will say, uh, continue. Like, continue through this NPC dialogue. I think that's ultimately probably a better way to do it. Uh, in particular, there are spots in the game where I leverage the kind of auto-queuing functionality for stylistic effect. Uh, like, left, right, left, right, 
your walking through the desert forms a meditative, uh, meditative whatever. Um, in a spot like that, I think it's uh, good or like functional. Uh, it is a lot worse in just anything with a lot of like real dialogue. In particular, there is like an exchange between the librarian and the sentient book in the game. Uh, that is fairly long, or like has uh, a lot of lines in it. And at first, I just wrote out all of those lines and stuff, and it was just like shook, 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 shook. Oh, that is, you know, paragraph and a half or whatever that I'm throwing in front of the player, and it's hard to read while it's moving, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It makes a lot more sense now, having like implemented it like this. Why the, that's not the thing that Disco Elysium or whatever does. Um, I might rework it to, uh, use the continue or whatever, uh, make a function that spits a continue into the box and etc, etc. Uh, but yeah, I, I was just kind of like, well, I'm going to write around the downside to my implementation in the dialogue as it is, and in the future, maybe I clean it up, maybe I... Uh, whatever. That's that's the case with a lot of things in the game, like uh, the art assets were all done by me and pretty much all of them rushed through. Some of the code implementation stuff is just like, it works, it's not 100% ideal, it's not like, you know, the uh, maybe cleanest or best way to do the thing or whatever, but it would take three hours or an hour or something to redo it. And I want to get the game done. Uh, perfect is the enemy of shipping projects or something. I forget the actual thing, but that was very much a focus for me throughout the project of just like, listen, we need to get this out the door, get this happening. Uh, it, it's okay. That, I've kind of digressed from the code functionality stuff, but don't worry about it. Yeah, so if it's not the player, getting back to the dialogue stuff, if it's not the player, it will set NPC flip-flop to true, uh, it will put some weights, or like weights for the line animation and stuff. I ended up picking one second for a lot of the timing variables and things just because that is an easy variable to put in a bunch of different places where we're animating stuff, so we can do a second or a half second or whatever, and it all kind of fits together nicely. You don't have anything going way faster or way slower or whatever. Um, and that will set up a line, uh, manage portrait, which is the thing that I use for changing the, uh, portrait, the speaker portrait, um, as that stuff pops up, like the first portrait in the game is the great glowing coils, and that fades in over the course of a second, thanks to the manage portrait function that we'll get to. Um, and then, yeah, get next dialogue line, wait a second, NPC flip-flop, etc. If neither player, uh, if it's not an end or a line, um, then it is options? Yeah. So we wait for a second, we manage the portrait, and then we set up options. Okay. Prime buttons. So the prime buttons function. <laughs> Uh, we started off by clearing choices, and clear choices is, uh, for each C bit of content, I think. Mm. In choices, uh, get node, items, get children, queue free, so we just kill every item with- that's kind of a sub thing of the choices box. Um, and then we say button text equals player dialogue, uh, choices equals instantiate option, instantiate uh, we should talk about instantiating things, probably. Choices set dialog, choices.connect. Um, we're manually setting, or, or dynamically setting, rather, uh, the spawned button. We're connecting that back to a uh, uh, push button function in this code. So we can, yeah, create buttons and make sure that they're still connected to this function, even though we don't know what the buttons are at, like, time of code compiling or whatever, uh, there's a better way to phrase that, it's fine. Instantiating is big and scary, it's sort of. Uh, so we're doing two pieces of instantiation. Instantiation, for if you're a beginner like I was, 
uh, is like running another Godot kind of main scene. Uh, a scene will have like some nodes and things, uh, kind of your Photoshop layers or whatever for a like point of comparison, and some code and stuff. And instantiation says like, hey, we, we can just spawn that as like an object. That seems useful. So we're instantiating uh, both the, this is not terribly clearly labeled for the purposes of this video, but instantiate test is the speaker dialog, the kind of scrolling chat. Uh, and then instantiate option is the buttons and stuff. Uh, so in the speaker dialog stuff, this is probably the other part of this code that is pulled most directly from like some random answer on the internet. We, uh, we're doing a bunch of things to format uh, a couple of text boxes, a couple of rich text labels, um, just ensuring that, like, setting a bunch of fit content is on, scroll active on, etc, etc. Uh, and that, all of that working together with the formatting stuff in here, uh, results in the kind of Disco Elysium-ish, uh, colored speaker name, dash, text, indent below the speaker name etc. Um, yeah, this this stuff's mainly handling uh, anchor justification and stuff and ensuring that the text labels grow correctly. Uh, await ready we do in here because when we're dynamically creating a thing that can have just be weird. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to trying to move quickly. Uh, and then in here, oh, right, this this is something that's a little bit awkward or, like, potentially clunky, I don't know. Um, I'll maybe talk about, like, plans for developing things in the future at the end of the video. Uh, in here is w where we are checking the speaker name uh, to set the name color and stuff. There's probably a cleaner way to do that, or, like, we can probably manage it from the main script, but it's another, like... I know how this works, don't want to change it, etc, etc, type of thing. Uh, and then we append uh, the, the person's name, or like after we have stuff set, person's name, the m dash, and then the actual line content happens in here. And yeah, we have that instantiation, we can feed it variables from the main script. Uh, do 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 choices, um, sorry, not the buttons, but yeah, we can feed, feed it things. I guess we'll get there in a second. Uh, the buttons dialogue is similar, or this is something I set up after having learned all of that from, the, uh, setting up the dialogue. Um, yeah, we, we have the buttons, Ugh, test text butts, just, just cause, you know. Um, if not, if node is not ready, await, make sure that things set up properly, uh, tween, modulate the alpha of the button options or whatever so they fade in. That's just a style thing, it looks a little bit nicer than the buttons kind of going and popping into existence. Uh, set the label text as dialogue, so yeah, we feed dialogue to the, the function or whatever, and then function on pressed emit signal pressed signal pressed um we we declare stuff like this or this is a really basic implementation of uh sending out a signal from something and we check for pressed in the code uh to trigger things and stuff um oh yeah sorry uh my inexperience plus trying to move quickly just for the sake of video length and stuff working together great uh so yeah when the player uh when a button is pressed uh it will send a chat message uh to our end send chat message will send username and button text or speaker name and button text um username and button text sorry to the main dialogue thing uh it will then clear the choices out of the little but the box or whatever and it will set up the, or get next dialogue line which will once again check like is it an npc is it the player is it options etc etc i think we're th getting through the the meat of it in terms of functionality setup line 
Uh, we have get speaker get flap I variable names yeah. Uh, get speaker get the content if speaker equals uh, send chat message. This is a specific thing to do with the plot. Uh, if you know a character's name uh, in this setup line thing, it will manually alter um, some of the scripting dialogue and stuff from Clyde to uh, just a different name uh, at this spot in here, because this just felt like a simpler implementation to me rather than like writing a separate speaker name in Clyde and adding a, an additional speaker to the new dialogue line and stuff and etc etc. Um, set up options. Oh, clear choices, clear out uh, buttons and stuff. Um, get the speaker things, uh, get the speaker, what they're saying, and then, uh, for each option in the list of options provided, we run through a loop. Uh, for each thing in the loop, we spawn a margin container, um, custom minimum size, uh, and we also spawn a instantiate, uh, the, the options button thing from earlier. <laughs> Me just manually reading through this and checking that I know what's happening. Uh, then we take that thing that we instantiated and we set the dialogue um, and connect the pressed stuff, or like, we connect the button's pressed signal to the main code. Uh, we bind it to a specific index, so it will say like, hey, index 1 pressed, index 2 pressed, etc, etc. Uh, there was also a thing I ran into, uh, a problem I ran into in doing this implementation, um, that, where did I put the fix in, or where is the actual thing? Uh, the margin container that I'm spawning to offset the choices a little bit, uh, that will get counted as an index object, which is annoying. Um, like this little blank space to help. Uh, separate these. On option selected, uh, index var decision, uh, dialog.choose the index, so we look at like, did you click the first thing, second thing, etc. Uh, decision equals get choices index plus index. This is the fix for the screwed up index thing. So yeah, because we're spawning two things for each index stuff, I, I had a bunch of other ways of Doing, st doing this, basically, that were not correct, not the way to do it. Um, just like adding a for loop that put in uh, additional index or in index increments or whatever, or like in incrementing the index with the margin counter spawn and stuff, and that was all clunky. The easier way to do it is just when we're checking what was pressed, just double increment the index, um, and that, or index plus index, adds up to being the thing that we pressed. Uh, so that's nice. Then in button, uh, we set the button text to decision text. We execute a bunch of things. We send the chat message, we get the next dialogue line, we clear choices again, we clear choices and clear stuff out of the choice, uh, the options box, box a bunch. It's not always strictly necessary, but it's helpful for just like ensuring nothing dangles and get left gets left behind. Uh, in send chat message, whenever we call that, we instantiate the chat stuff that I sort of talked through. Uh, and then we also have a user bool that we have, um, that we are checking for if username, do, 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 do. oh, duh, right, yes, okay, sorry, we're, we're checking whether or not the speaker is the username, the player name. Um, just because that lets us generate a user bool, like, is it the player speaking? Uh, if so, we can send that bool to the, uh, to the instantiated speaker option stuff. And then we say, if user bool true, um, set cornflower blue for the speaker color. This lets us change the player name without uh, having to, like, manually in here account for every possible name that the player can have. Or, or like, you know, just uh, doing a bad implementation of that. Um, that's maybe overkill, or, like, that. that's more of a style thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, after we do that, we pass everything to set dialogue to the instantiated uh, thingamajig. 
add to the child, add message spacing, trigger round robin, message click. Round robin is a function I wrote um, to play audio, because I just can't shut off the audio designer sound music degree in me. Um, yeah, so round robin, uh, we declare some audio files at the start of the script. Um, the one that I use a lot, or that gets used a lot, is this message click. Uh, so we say, hey, play message click, play that mp3. Um, but when you play it, what? set the pitch scale to a random range between 0 0.9 and 1.1. And also set the volume scale to, or volumes in decibels, to a random range between minus 9 and minus 6. And then, finally, play that sound. Uh, that is a thing that you do round, it, it kind of, uh, it mimics round robin sampling or something, um, which is to say it gives a single sample a lot more variety. So you'll note that the clicks are all a little bit different, because they're being randomly altered each time. Godot can do some of this natively, or like there is a function in Audio Stream Player. Uh, stream, new Audio Stream, do, do, do one of these. Audio Stream Randomizer, I believe, can do a lot of this by itself. Um, I was planning at some point to more aggressively like load files in and out of audio players because I didn't quite get how Godot worked at the time or how it handled audio at the time. It doesn't, uh, Godot wants an audio stream per sound basically. You can do stuff to swap out the sound that the audio stream player is playing, um, but it's not great. Uh, the polyphony in an audio player is for polyphony of the single sound that it's playing. Um, you can't, like, cue a sound, switch, play another sound, etc. That just will not work. So, yeah, this, uh, this is how it kind of ended up at the end. Uh, something I'd like to do in the future, or, like, uh, a future thing, yeah, is there are things on the asset library that uh, have a more sophisticated um, audio implementation, uh, or they say like, "Hey, I uh, this plugin, Audio Stream Player, do, 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 Resonate Audio Manager. This will be this will fill the kind of like dialogue manager role, but for audio, which is to say, it will dynamically create audio stream players or whatever, do whatever you need with them, uh, despawn them, etc., uh, cut off the l last." or dynamic culling, uh, words. Um, so yeah, in the future I would probably download Resonate or something for more sophisticated audio implementations. For what we're doing here, th this worked, or I ended up using like two in here, and also we have an auto load. Um, an auto load is a thing that you can set to play just when, uh, stuff starts. It is similar to uh, the just loading stuff in as a variable or whatever here. Um, but instead we're saying like, hey, this, this scene, uh, th this absolutely blank scene, etc. load this at the start. The player won't be able to see it or interact with it or anything, but that's okay. In the script, we are going to, uh, do, 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 do the absolute bare basic stuff. I have some random things in here, I guess. We're going to do some stuff, uh, oh yeah, it's actually in here, or like in the audio stream player itself. Um, we have loopable this loopable ambience that I made a while ago, um, and we're going to automatically play that. Yeah, I think you can set auto loads in what project settings, auto load. This is the way I did it. Yeah, you get a script or whatever, or sit, point to the Godot uh, thing, enable. It's fine, we got to round robin message, click. Message spacing, this will spawn, um, yeah, this spawns a margin, an empty margin container uh, in the, the the chat history thing, and we can just call that whenever, so I have that loop at the start that calls a bunch of them. I'd intended to use this more for dynamic effect of like calling it multiple times between certain dialogue messages or whatever. That didn't end up happening in the kind of game writing that I did, but you know, still saves a little bit of, like, line space or whatever. 
Uh, clear choices, yeah, we call that in a bunch of places one of the slimmer functions um, to call all the choices. Uh, but that's fine. Manage portraits. In the manage portrait thing, we have a bunch of variables that are each a discrete JPEG, and we load those in. And then whenever manage portrait is called, we say, hey, the, the person speaking, if they are speaker, uh, put that, if the speaker is the librarian, set the portrait texture to the librarian. If the speaker is the gray glowing coils, set the portrait re erect texture to glowing coils. And yeah, that is a, that's not a color panel. Uh, color rect panels are good for like fade to blacks, uh, fade to black effects or whatever, but we are using an actual uh, texture rect panel, which is like the good way to load in JPEGs or PNGs or whatever into Godot. Uh, so we have all that stuff and we're, we're checking, um, yeah, we're checking for that stuff. Or sorry, to, to go through it sequentially, uh, we check the speaker or we say hey let's look at the speaker play an animation we say portrait out fade out if there's no portrait presence a uh, present you won't see any change but uh the portrait it, it will still kind of uh fade to black and that takes like a half second um it, it's a half second to animation in the animation player uh and then we await portrait animator animation finished um, this was a big area where, like, tweening and trying to wait for tweens to finish or whatever was just horrific. With Animation Player, it was easy enough to go, hey, in, in 2D, go into Animation, uh, grab an Animation Player node, set up all this stuff, um, th there's more detailed tutorials online, etc, etc. Uh, we get Animation set up, and then we can just check, like, once they've run their course, uh, change the thing, so you will never see the portrait click over, uh, between, or, like, change between things. And then, after the texture, or the portrait rect has been changed to the new speaker, um, then we execute, a portrait in, a fade in effect. Uh, and that is, yeah, helpful. Uh, after all of that, we set speaker memory to the current speaker, and that's relevant for some reason. <laughs> if speaker is different from speaker memory, right. So at the end of this, um, this is to ensure that the animations and stuff don't fire if the same speaker is talking for multiple uh, messages in a row. So like great glowing coils saying a bunch of things at the start here, but the portrait isn't blinking in and out. Uh, so like, because we are throwing the, checking the speaker and putting it into memory and etc. Uh, but when the librarian starts speaking, the portrait fades out, we get replaced it with the, the good good block face. Um, and then, yeah, uh, stuff happens. Can we get Clyde here? No, we can't. The, the dice did not favor me. Uh, yeah, Velocity pulls a blank portrait, where we have, yeah, Velocity set texture blank, um, this is a PNG, a blank PNG with transparency, if I remember correctly. It's just helpful, so we don't have to muck with uh, the animation stuff. Like, we don't have to animate to blank, which is a diff would be a different, like, function from the rest of the implementation and things, and... Oh, this is, this is too long. This video is too long. It's fine, we're getting there. We're, we're near the end uh, by length. Um, there are various spots in the game where you can roll dice. There's, I think, literally one spot per stat. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, implement the day, uh, basic Disc Elysium roll 2d6 thing, uh, was the thought with this. So we can pass a stat value to this function. Uh, and then we have two variables. Each of them are just a random integer generator. Uh, with 6 plus 1, um, uh, or like we're setting the thing to generate a value between 1 and 6, rather. And then the roll result that this thing will generate, uh, or it will set the variable, the global variable, rather, uh, to uh, dice 1 plus dice 2 plus stat. So it is a, yeah, 2d6 plus stat 
kind of system. Yeah, and then we check that against a DC, a difficulty check, um, and etc. Uh, expose dice. Yeah, this is the thing I use for actually printing the results of a dice roll. Uh, variable good, bad. If roll result is let lower than the difficulty check, uh, good, bad equals uh, the coils did not favor you. If the roll result's higher, hey, good job, the coils favor you. So good, bad is a string. Um, it's good programming practice or whatever to do static variable declaration or like to say, uh, good, bad, uh, is it, I don't know, string. Hmm. This is why I didn't do it because I just literally didn't remember the formatting for the thing. Uh, but yeah, anyway, sorry, distracting myself. Uh, we th we generate that line of text, we play a dice roll sound, which is why we have the second audio stream player, just cue that dice roll, play it, um, and then we generate some more string stuff, or the roll string is rolled, uh, string, roll result, uh, and then we put good bad after it. Uh, send chat message to the dice this full roll string, uh, and we set NPC flip-flop here, because the dice roll is not the player. Um, so we set that to true. And yeah, we already covered the round robin function. On event triggered... Okay, so on event triggered is a Clyde function. Um, it's some, like, one of the default things Clyde will do. Um, and from Clyde, we can say... Uh, I mentioned Clyde triggers way at the start. Uh, we can say show Astingrad or show black or whatever. Yeah, trigger show Astingrad interior. Um, and in the main script, that will uh, generate show Astingrad interior. Manage background. Uh, that is a function like manage the manage portrait function we just walked through. Um, Aston Grad Interior, .jpg, faded in, etc. Uh, and we're doing other things with this too, because, yeah, this is our, our main way of getting stuff out of Clyde, or one of two main ways. Uh, if event name equals courier, set player stats to this stat spread. Uh, if it is boxer, they have two strength, one charisma, zero the dexterity, negative one insight, I think that's what it works out to, etc. Um, we'll, I didn't, initially I was, I told the player each individual stat, it felt clunky, it felt like overloading them with information for a relatively minimal mechanic, so I ended up just saying like, hey, you're really good at this one thing, really bad at this other thing, don't worry about the zeros and ones. Um, and yeah, that, that stuff happens. Uh, if event name is roll strength, roll 2d6 strength, uh, we get the v v variables, the player variables out of Clyde, or like both Clyde and the main dialogue will have the same variables. Uh, eventually, I don't think we've covered that, but yeah. Um, roll 2d6 strength, dialogue set variable, uh, rolled, roll strength, roll result. So this puts the, uh, roll result back into Clyde under a roll strength name. I'd labeled these kind of confusingly, or I ended up having uh, their separate things. There's the roll strength trigger and the roll strength variable. In the future, I would name them different things, because it's not great to have both of them named the same, even if it technically works. Uh, and then we say, hey, expose the dice, or like tell the player what they rolled. Uh, and this all works reasonably well. There's also a print thing in here for debugging, or just for knowing what happened. Um, and yeah, that is the event triggered stuff. Manage background, I already kind of gestured at. Super duper similar to the player portrait stuff. Um, or almost identical, actually. It's just a separate thing for, um... Background load background file. Right, I do this weird trick. I'm remembering now. Doing it like that means that within the Clyde dialog, or this is a way for us to manage the background from within Clyde, so you don't really want to be managing all the background stuff inside Clyde because that clogs up 
the Clyde function even more than it's already clogged up because we're trying to like pull a ton of things out of Clyde. Um, we we just say hey manage background and then we feed the manage background function an entire file path. Um, and that actually lets us do what I think is a more process efficient implementation of the manage portrait function. Uh, in that we only are dynamically like loading and animating a single file thing instead of loading all of them and then checking the speaker, uh, checking the portrait that we need to actually animate and, and stuff. Um, oh God, I don't know if I have complicated feelings about that. I'm, I'm mostly surprised that this worked or this ended up being like a, a good way to do this because it doesn't feel like that should be a sensible way to do things to me anyway but yeah that that happened um player stats this is just so again uh we're not clogging up clyde with a billion things and repeating uh <clears throat> this every time for each character class that we have um yeah in, in general the class the kind of character class and stat implementation and stuff is like i could let players manually pick their own stats and stuff but one it's a relatively small function in the game like i don't want them to worry about it or spend too much time on it two uh building the ui for manually setting the stats and stuff i i at this point in coding the game know i could do it but i don't want to spend the three hours or whatever doing it or not three hours but you know uh and and etc etc so it's like uh give them character classes make a function for kind of bulk setting the stats or like synchronizing everything um and yeah i don't know it it worked out i think it, it is a reasonable way to handle stuff on variable changed is another big clyde thing the two things that we are looking at for this are dc the difficulty check um so whenever we're changing the difficulty check in clyde it will uh, update the variable, or it will p change the difficulty check variable in the main script to match whatever Clyde says. Um, and again, we're printing that, and we are also managing the one character's name. So if the player knows Cynthia, and we flag that in Clyde, Cynthia also known in the main text here, and I think you already showed off the function, or yeah, we, we manually kind of hot swap a uh, weird creepy lady or whatever I call her to Cynthia. Um, and yeah, uh, it, it's a handy function. Uh, there's also like, I didn't end up using set gets and stuff and probably shouldn't talk about them because this video is so long. We're not doing anything at process speed. Process is per frame in Godot and yeah, don't use process if you don't have to. Um, process is often used for like physics functions and stuff. Um, your game will run smoother if you're not doing stuff with process. Oh, okay, so this is, this video is like easily twice as long as I wanted it to be, if not more, but we're, we're getting through things, or like we talked, uh, covered everything, um, yeah, part, part of the goal in walking through things like that is just literally let people copy the text down or whatever. I guess I could upload this to like Patreon or something, but I don't know if people would be interested in that. I'll probably make a, a comment, pinned comment about that. As a general thought or like wrapping up, um, is good, is a good project. It was initially very frustrating because uh, the dialogue manager stuff, like not ha having the other dialogue man managers not work for the game and so on. Burned a lot of time, was very frustrating, etc. Once that was out of the way and it was like, hey, Clyde works for as nitpicky as I can be about it, not letting me write in hypertext or whatever. Uh, yeah. Once I had Clyde, is I kind of was off to the races in terms of uh, having fun new problems of learning how to animate and stuff. Um, and yeah, good good learning project there. Learned a ton about Godot. Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend the uh, programming in Godot. Uh, my other bits of programming, or like to just talk about my game dev experience in general, I, for a couple of years, I've been intermittently releasing tabletop RPGs. 
Uh, very small ones for the most part, between 1 and 20 pages, mostly in the 1 to 5 page range. Uh, I also coded a game in Unreal Engine, and I was not that happy with it. Um, it was a 3D kind of arena shooter thing, single player arena shooter, you deal with uh, PP robots and stuff. And while it's a lot, uh, it's a flashier game than this is as like a janky visual novel with uh, my rushed ass art and so on. Um, it's a flashier game, but I ended up not feeling like I had a super firm grasp on uh, Unreal stuff. Um, and, and, and I, I don't know, I still don't know if I could do a lot with Unreal, uh, at, at this point. The main thing I use it for at this point is just, um, the odd video where I want to, like, make reviewing cards or something in Magic the Gathering more fun, because you just, like, load in PNGs or whatever, place them in the space, and yada yada yada. It's not too hard to do that stuff in Unreal, but yeah, I didn't feel I had a firm grasp on the engine, whereas having done all this, it's like, well, that's almost 300 lines of code, and I know, more or less, what all of them do. It might take me a second in some spots to remember what they do, but I can get there, I have a grasp on what's happening and can walk through the code and etc. That's part of the thing with doing this video too, is just like, remembering, uh, <laughs> trying to articulate this stuff for myself to help me remember it, and so on. Um, but yeah, I, I feel a lot better or more confident in Godot than I do in Unreal, having uh, cr done one project in each. Um, uh, other thoughts, other thoughts. This was a huge exercise I kind of gestured at already in just, like, scope management. Because, boy, it is so easy to just keep going like, oh, oh, I'm looking at the Disco Elysium uh, dialogue again, and they're animating the chat background to move up with the text when new text is spawned. And that actually looks really nice because the, the background is diegetic. It's police uh, microfiche or whatever, which kind of implies that Kim is uh, uh, recording the conversations and things, and I didn't actually notice that on my playthrough, and that's a really nice touch. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I was just like, I could, I could, uh, but that takes more time, and we just need to get it done, and etc. Uh, I'm not a great artist in general, too, but the yeah, a lot of the art in it is like, well, I took, you know, half an hour or whatever to do this, and... It's not great. I know if I spend four hours on a painting or something, it, it feels a lot better or looks a lot better. It looks, yeah, less uh, amateurish to be polite to myself. Um, but that's not what this game is. This is about learning Godot and etc. And we just need to get art done. And yeah, I, I'd encourage you to do the same if you're looking at doing a first time or beginner's project of just like, just absolute bare bones make it work. Uh, if you're doing like an RPG, 2D RPG, or a Mario game, like a platformer or something. Uh, Mario game, hmm. Um, yeah, if you're doing something like that, just go like, I'm gonna animate a circle, gonna animate the circle real well, or, or whatever. Like, don't worry about generating custom art assets and so on. Just get the thing done. Try to focus on getting the implementation working. Yeah, so I don't really know what next steps are for me, because uh, as I was kind of gesturing at in the Clyde section, there's some functionality and stuff that I, I want out of this that is just going to be difficult to get out of Clyde. Um, you can do additional things in Clyde of like tagging lines of dialogue, and that might be a way to get... Uh, to manually do like, okay, if a line has this tag, use a function that does all the normal uh, dialogue spawning stuff, but does it rainbow and wiggly. Um, and I don't... Uh, so I'm definitely at a spot with this where it's like, I'm proud of what I'm uh, proud of what I'm done, or like I'm a, I'm happy with it in the sense that this is a ton of work and the thing is finished and I learned a lot and yay. But also, there, there's kind of this split uh, ambivalence, or this thing of like, oh, if, if if my janky learning game can be kind of cool or whatever, oh, imagine what I could do now that I know how to actually do things. Yay! 
but uh, I now know how much work all this is from having done my janky learning game. Um, and oh god, doing a bigger game or a more complicated game. Uh, panic. So yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure what I want to do. I think a general goal short term is I want to genericize my front end implementation. By which I mean there's some stuff in here that is specific to this game. Uh, the super easy example just being like modifying that woman's name in one function. Um, strip that stuff out, make it a thing that I can port o over into future development, because that's a nice thing with Godot, because you can do the instantiation and stuff, uh, in the future, or like, for a next game, I can have the dialogue be a thing that I spawn in, and, like, animate coming in from the side with animation player, and etc., and I know how to do all that now, and then I can work on an entire separate, like, core gameplay loop and have this entire dialogue system in my back pocket and not have to spend another, uh, like, 20 hours or whatever, uh, you know, doing dialogue stuff. Uh, so yeah, ma making kind of this work more portable between projects is probably, like, the most f functional short-term goal, uh, and then after that, I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, it's been doing okay on itch.io. Uh, I don't know if I want to show my actual itch analytics just for risk of like doxing myself or whatever. Um, good initial bunch of people playing it, and then yeah, it's doing numbers similar to a bunch of my tabletop RPGs combined, which is encouraging. Um, or like speaks to a a thing that uh, is embedded in the web being a little bit more playable, a little bit broader interest than, like, a single-player uh, tabletop RPG or paper RPG or something if you're not Grant Howitt. Uh, not not to, like, uh, uh, badmouth Grant Howitt or whatever. One of my favorite designers, or, like, a designer I respect a lot, uh, there's just a difference between making a one-page RPG as someone with, like, name recognition and so on, and then as me. Um, so yeah, initial analytics and things is neat, or like that, that kind of is encouraging in terms of like, I don't know, I'd make another game and get more game stats going, brr, uh, this is content creator brain on full display, I'm, I'm aware. Um, yeah, uh... Wow, I'm faded at this point. I, th that's probably a good spot to end the video. There might be things I'm forgetting, but listen, we're already uh, about an hour or a little over an hour deep into this, so... I don't know, if you had, have questions or whatever, uh, let me know. I'll try to answer them. Um, I don't currently have any plans to upload this code and stuff anywhere. I'm not 100% sure if I could, because the project directory and stuff is a bit of a mess. But yeah, let me know if you want me to, uh, that would probably be like a Patreon reward or something, or uh, traditionally I reserve, like, this type of work assets, uh, and so on for, uh, the $3 tier or above. Um, yeah, let, let me know if you want that. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, uh hopefully this video is helpful or interesting. It's, uh, yeah. I don't know. Go go make games and stuff. Uh, have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for watching the video, and an extra big thank you to the Patreon patrons and YouTube members that help make these videos possible. Hope you have a wonderful day. Bye bye.